Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about are things, uh, some, some things we've been doing lately, and which is really uh, looking at IoT systems which are extremely resource constrained and yet rely on, uh, I guess I borrowed this phrase, learning enabled, uh, but it's basically systems where uh, machine learning in some form is playing a very really critical role in the sensing and uh, sensing side. So uh, if, I, if I look at these cyber physical systems, uh, IoT systems, one of the shift over whatever, 20 years or so that I've been dabbling with uh, these kind of systems is really, um, uh, we've kind of moved away from looking at uh, working close to sensors giving us information which we can use and they were directly measuring it. So kind of measurements and events coming out of the sensors were directly useful. So if you kind of go back to early 2000s, programs like DARPA Sensity and NSF, uh, the sensing program there and all, uh, we were basically measuring simple scalar values, kind of working. And what has changed uh, over the years is that we are beginning to work with systems where sensors give us information which have some correlation with what we are interested in, but really there's a big gap between what we measure and kind of the inferences and interventions that we derive from. Um, you know, some years ago, I kind of uh, began to work with a bunch of collaborators as part of some NIH projects where we kind of started looking at these kind of pipelines where we have sensor data, from that we derive biomarkers. Traditionally, biomarkers have been things like blood pressure and things like that. They're, they're very close to what the sensors give you, but now suddenly we are looking at things like, are you stressed, are you depressed? There is no sensor for that. We need to infer these things from a lot of, uh, from information which have some correlation. Um, from that, you kind of figure out what trajectory sort of the state will take. Uh, and then finally, interventions. In some cases, these interventions are autonomous, but in a lot of cases, it's just guiding a human decision maker. So in, uh, in the space, sort of we dabble with digital biomarkers plus this notion of just-in-time kind of interventions and so on. And this is just one space. I mean, there are many other uh, application domains. Smart buildings is another one. One which I kind of enjoy working quite quite a lot with and has a lot of collaborators is a DOD space. Uh, I work very closely with Army Research Lab and AFSR, where kind of as you might imagine, uh, it's a messy, dynamic, fluid situation. And again, kind of things that we are trying to infer are often not something that sensors kind of give you directly. Common to all of these is kind of this notion that somehow you know, from the physical world to a series of perception and some sort of reasoning over them and eventually some sort of action is driving, driving this. So uh, uh, as I'm sure, uh, uh, all of you in some shape and form have encountered this is kind of a bunch of technologies which came together to cause this shift or enable this shift. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the richness of sensors. I mean, in my early days of my career, the sensors were just things like temperature and pressure and things like that. But now we work with LIDARs and acoustic arrays and uh, sort of imagers and different frequency bands. I mean, we think of imagers just as cameras, but they kind of operate at many uh, different uh, frequencies. Second, of course, is that the shift from first principles type mechanistic ways of dealing with the sensor data to one where honestly sort of lots of data and uh, learn a model and kind of work with them with all the problems which come with it, right? They're sort of opaque, poorly explainable, we can't, uh, 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 can't uh, make promises around it. Nevertheless, the uh, performance and the capabilities they offer are such that uh, they have been very exciting. And finally, particularly relevant to IoT is that traditionally these things at the very edge were kind of just microcontrollers, but now increasingly we have hardware accelerators of different types, uh, uh, accelerating different types of bits and neural layers and things like that. Just the confluence of these three is suddenly sort of um, creating a type of systems which uh, have been kind of uh, interesting to me. So the way I kind of summarize it is that the first generation systems were specialized sensors. And by that, what I mean is that the hardware carried bulk of the uh, burden, gave us results uh, which were already in 
sufficiently structured form. So that's kind of the second element, low dimensionally structured data basically emerging from the sensors. And then finally, kind of, uh, since we already had that, then the model uh, or the way we operated with them was basically um, those driven by first principles. So I come from an E background, so signal processing, control theory, these kind of things. What has now begun to happen uh, in recent years is that we are basically employing uh, mass market, what I call as universal sensors, and I call them universal in the sense that a jack of all trades, okay? I mean, I can, from an image or from an uh, inertial sensor or some sensor, I can make all sort of inferences provided I have sufficient uh, way of extracting this information. So the underlying data are very high dimensional, unstructured, um, uh, and but the models we are working with them are now these uh, data driven kind of high cost models, but that's where the accelerators come in. So my talk really is gonna be about kind of how we are uh, sort of going around designing these kind of uh, systems that have emerged. Now, just to give you a sense of like what all we are able to do. So if you look at kind of the puny little um, yeah, IMU chip, which is kind of shown out there, uh, started out as just a screen orientation thing back in early days of smartphone, like 2005 or so. And now we can do all sorts of things with it, right? I mean, all sorts of human activity states, uh, yeah, kind of great uh, way of interacting uh, with these devices and kind of just across the projects we have. I mean, we kind of use these things for like uh, trajectories of sea animals under ocean, um, underwater robots, um, uh, sort of uh, human activity, obviously. So there is no shortage and just the same information simply because the uh, world has a lot of movement. Movement gets captured by IMUs and even though we lack the first principles knowledge of these, but models are turning out to be pretty good at interacting. Not without problems, but certainly one which, uh, which is pretty good. Um, another uh, notion is that uh, oftentimes our ability to extract information lets us do things quickly. So for example, uh, in a paper which will appear at CVPR shortly, uh, we kind of show that how uh, cameras, kind of millimeter wave radars, both of which are sufficiently cheap devices, let's say a few tens of dollars, uh, by combining them creatively using the right type of model, we can basically get dense depth map, the kind of stuff that you would normally get from LIDAR. So this ability to uh, create sensory data with previously only costly hardware code is something new. And I think um, also emerging in this space is kind of generative type models where again, uh, Yasser was pointing out just a conversation a few days ago that how uh, from a few images, now we can get 3D stuff, which is making uh, SLAM in robotics very really, uh, powerful. So I think, I think this capability of virtual sensing, which has always been around, but not in the kind of sophisticated form that currently exists. And then finally, uh, multimodal uh, setups where you combine information from uh, various things. So like a camera tells me what's in the scene, who are there and all, but then if I were to overlay on it information from let's say ultra wide band uh, radio or Wi-Fi radio, I can begin to get the internal state. Uh, so a much deeper sense of what is going on. So in this slide, we kind of uh, depict the system that we created where um, we uh, using ultra wide band radars, which is uh, the same kind of radio which is in your iPhone uh, when when it works with your AirTag, for example. Uh, we can basically remotely pick up vibrations and that lets us do things like in a room with multiple people, we can kind of distinguish between their heart rate or breathing uh, stuff, or if there are appliances and all, which one is running, which one is not, those kind of things we can pull off. Um, again, lots of problems come in there, but this is kind of showing that um, uh, the ability to fuse is moved away from very simplistic uh, different pathways, let's work or getting onto it to one way to be a more sophisticated inference. So uh, with these things, if you kind of go back, the challenge that comes is that in principle, they are great, but the moment uh, when it comes to implementing these things, we kind of uh, uh, hit, hit, hit the bottom. And they are very complex systems to actually realize and deploy. And so time and again, what happens is like I teach a merit system course, I also teach a course on 
um, uh, processing of sensory information and all. And we'll always start out with these ambitions about let's create this system. Things will run on some edge devices. And then halfway through the quarter, the students will come. It's too hard. Can we just run it, collect the data, and show it working on MATLAB or something like that? And soon we come to that. Uh, and the problem is that uh, combining these two vastly distinct skill sets, system skills with machine learning skills, is not something that sort of a lot of lot of lot of us have. So when it comes to implementing these systems. If the approach is one where the data are low bandwidth enough, you can upload it to some sort of a cloud server or on-premise server, yes, we can do these things pretty well. In other cases, we are lucky that our edge devices are, what I would call it high-end IoT devices, your smartphone or Raspberry Pi or Galaxy Nano and these kind of devices, again, kind of we are able to do that. But then there is this world of relatively resource-constrained IoT devices where again, we seek to do the same things, but between the combination of relatively low bandwidth and uh, relatively sort of uh, low compute power, we kind of begin to hit uh, more, more of a problem. So is this corner useful? Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, these tinier devices like your wristwatch or little tags and all, they have IMUs, That's, they're pretty cheap to put in. Um, um, and we like to be able to do things like 3D tracking and all gesture recognition or overall telemetry. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, we kind of do it with uh, uh, sort of these first two approaches um, out here, which is more kind of first principles based, right? Uh, double integration or kind of dead reckoning type methods and all. They fit into these. <coughs> devices which have kilobytes of RAMs and sort of a small number of megabytes of flash and all. But on the at the same time, sort of uh, methods which are coming from uh, the world of deep learning are proving to be much better at handling things like sensor drift and gravity pollution and things like that, except that these models are bigger. Some, a lot of times these models are basically borrowed from the world of computer vision and kind of just shoehorn into these, these kind of problems. Now, some of you may have heard of um, this term tiny ML, uh, and uh, which is kind of this world of machine learning in the tiny arena. Uh, so it's a community, and as well as some associated sort of tools that have begun to emerge, like TensorFlow, like Micro, which kind of targets uh, this space, except they kind of are focused still thus far on just the basic low level support. Uh, part of the challenge out here is you are in a space where you're like if you're working with MCUs, your uh, memories are so tiny, you can't even fit the entire mach machine learning model at the same time. So there's a memory management going on where you're bringing in parameters as needed, putting them back on the flash, and a lot of complicated uh, implementation uh, stuff that goes on. So the driving motivation behind what I'm talking about really is that right now to build these kind of systems, you really need to be an expert in both machine learning and embedded systems. Um, and that's, 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 that's the challenge. And uh, a very similar issue sort of I mean, my, back, back when I was doing my PhD, it was kind of the earlier days of VLSI and application specific VLSI were emerging and we, there was kind of the same challenge that to harness this technology, we needed to both know about the algorithm because a lot of optimizations and all were happening at the domain application domain level. And yet you also needed to know about the nitty gritties of the underlying sort of hardware and all. And that led to kind of this um, sort of uh, over 1980s and 1990s, uh, kind of these tool chains emerged where to some extent now, kind of starting from some sort of a high level description, uh, depending on languages like System C or MATLAB and all, we could kind of go through this phase of architecture exploration where you could do area, time, energy kind of trade offs, and then high level synthesis where you kind of get to map it into what exists on your chip, um, so some sort of register type of level descriptions in hardware log PhD kind of languages. So the way I kind of see it is that right now for these type of systems, we are kind of in the same boat, which is um, if, if you have access to 
um, expertise on both sides. We can create these systems, but it's not certainly something that can be easily scaled. So the way I kind of pose it is, what do what will the design flow for these kind of um, tiny IoT systems look like? What 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 all do we need to uh, uh, make it happen? And um, some of the work so they've been doing lately, they're kind of uh, exploring kind of exploring that. I mean, as we build these systems, we kind of iterate, sort of creating things, and so kind of sort of present some of the ideas out there. So, by the way, feel free to interrupt me along the way. Uh, just any questions, you don't have to keep it at the end. Um, so, uh, so uh, just by way of background, as I mentioned, tiny machine learning. It's like I said, it's a boutique community. Uh, so around it. What is it? So it's really kind of two things that exist out there. It's a set of hardware and a set of software, which are really targeting this world of always on, ultra low power, on device, machine learning analytics, okay? If um, uh, these things are not limited to just processors, but that's the common case. So they work with microcontrollers uh, type devices, uh, companies like SP Microelectronics and, and RF and all are kind of active in this space. Here you're talking about, like I said, RAMs, which are in kilobytes, flash, which are in megabytes. You are in the world of microwatts and milliwatts and uh, single core or few core type processors. Um, yeah, some hardware support for uh, feature extraction, sort of oftentimes sensors and all kind of integrated with these things. So those platforms are there and uh, kind of uh, you find them in products like, like cameras which can recognize face or tracking track users and little radar units have, which have intelligence and all there. And there is a world of corresponding world of software. So the tool chains that we normally work with in machine learning, TensorFlow, PyTorch, you know, there are kind of variants which have begun to emerge where they take your model, compress them, quantize the bytes, remove neurons, remove layers, um, and sort of you have uh, some of these things that are listed out there. Uh, so they handle kind of this low level nitty gritty. How do I uh, optimize, compress the model? Uh, how do I take care of kind of actually running the model on a device which is so resource constrained? What they don't do is really kind of, as I'll show there are a few things that uh, um, sit between where we currently are in this world of uh, tiny ML versus where we kind of need to be. So if, but sort of stepping back again to tiny ML for a moment. So the way these systems, well, sort of the design flow proceeds is there is kind of uh, this initial phase of just working with the data. A lot of the work in this case is still in the world of the supervised machine learning, if you may, right? So one thing which makes sensory data very hard to work with is it's very hard to get labeled data, okay? Particularly labeled data, which are not polluted by artifacts of this collecting, right? I mean, imagine we have to ask users to kind of label the data as they're going along, uh, either that or do it retrospectively, uh, both, 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 uh, present significant challenges. So there's a lot of stuff just in this phase which comes comes into play. Um, lightweight models, a very typical sort of paradigm which has now emerged is that you pick some sort of a parametrized model architecture um, where things like let's say number of layers, different neurons, uh, uh, there are parameters and then you kind of engage in some sort of a optimization driven architecture search process over it, neural architecture search if, as it is called. And typically what is done is a problem is phased in a manner where it's differentiable. So you can again use some sort of a gradient descent kind of approach out there. And then finally, uh, uh, sort of this gets mapped to the platform and uh, there's some stuff which has begun to emerge where there's a bit of online fine tuning that may happen for the model because uh, as I'll talk about later, these tinier models are also more brittle. So uh, kind of their robustness across different operating conditions is trickier to do. So kind of uh, oftentimes we do need to kind of go back and personalize or customize this. So, uh, so, these, so, so the basic sort of underpinnings have emerged, um, yeah, but um, kind of the focus still is 
how can I take a neural network model, squeeze it down so that I can sort of run it? There's a lot between where we currently are and where we uh, need to be, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Today. So a quick question. Yeah. So one of the things that you started off with is the sensors have changed from specialized sensors to random sensors, or general purpose junk model trained sensors. But this architecture here, Sort of it's not limited to it, but um, yeah, certainly for things like IMU and sound and all. The uh, thing is the following, the specialized sensors, I don't need to put any sophisticated models. Right, no, but I guess the question is that if you look at this thing on the left-hand side as an IMU, for instance, now either one is able to identify a set of things in IMU that's interesting features which will then drive larger models. But if this is the online learning for larger models, is online learning for larger models. I want to be able to make richer inferences from that IMU data on directly from the IMU data. Those activities and the, uh, 3D trajectories and all directly from IMU on these things. The and design of this is incredibly complicated. It would be. Yeah, so actually as I will show that the models that been published are woefully large needlessly and mostly because they don't have the right tool chains to support them. And that's, that's why I'm motivating that, you know, with the right PDA kind of tool chains, we can actually optimize these things considerably. And we have seen major gains over public data. So yeah, just hang on for a little bit more. So, um, so what, what is missing in these things? So like I said, the world of tiny ML focused on neural network, let's squeeze it down. Let's say. But when you build these systems, it's not just a neural network. It's not, oftentimes, it's not even a single neural model. Uh, okay. And the reason is, the, but more crucially, it's often surrounded by kind of a lot of traditional code, okay, kind of symbolic code, if you may. Or, and the reason is that these are things which sit around your neural model to help deal with kind of yeah, constraints and rules of different forms that you need to operate under. And oftentimes, we are detecting things which are over longer time scales, like more complicated events as opposed to something which happened over a short time window. And right now, at least, sort of, we just don't, uh, I mean, these are finite state machines and all, and that's that, that's what sur surrounds each one. So uh, the, these neural models must be trained and deployed in conjunction with the more traditional uh, software. For example, let's say I'm doing some tracking and stuff like that uh, in a complicated scene. So yes, things like, YOLO 5, which is an object detection model, is the neural part. It gives me where the objects are, what the bounding boxes are. But then, if I'm trying to look for some pattern, let's say of some pattern of enemy activity, <coughs> I need kind of stuff around it. Or the example I have on the left side out here, let's say in a hospital setting, my cameras are giving me some object detection stuff. But now I want to look at uh, was there a sanitary protocol <coughs> violation? Again, these things transpire over long time durations. And so again, we kind of need uh, more traditional code. Or for example, I trained a neural model but uh -huh. then, uh, it may violate certain safety requirements. So perhaps I need some sort of a shield around my neural code just to prevent against some truly bad things from happening. Now, uh, so, so that, that's, that's the realm that these neural models must be trained together with sort of traditional uh, or one domain which I've been working for a bit lately, mostly with uh, DOD, is really this world of complex <laughs> events. Okay, so where atomic events, yes, my neural networks can um, uh, detect relatively well. They have sufficient context to, be, to work with those kind of contexts. But when I'm looking at these more complicated events, um, which are transpiring over tens of minutes or hours, then uh, the context length over which we need to work with is just way too large. So you basically head into the world of uh, combining that neural layer with some sort of a follow-on uh, traditional processing layer, trackers and tape machines. And in the world of database, uh, complex event processing has been around. So those kind of machinery sort of coming in. Uh, another reason uh, these symbolic things come into uh, play is also that uh, we want to, we want the user to be able to interact and guide uh, these things. So kind of this notion of explainability and tellability, telling the model about constraints. Um, in case of my military example, uh, let's say I'm operating in a different setting. So the enemy has some different tactics and procedures, uh, sort of providing that kind of information. And the flip side, why did something happen, right? Providing those 
explanations and auditing information and things like that. So uh, in the mainstream AI community, there is kind of this whole debate of can we do everything with neural network or do we combine and sort of this all neurosymbolic viewpoint which has emerged uh, where kind of we create models which combine the two sides, complementary strengths, uh, more performance uh, versus uh, and sort of uh, uh, more visibility versus more interpretability, more data efficiency and all. Um, in these systems, uh, for us, that's not a debate. We just are forced to have, forced to deal with these kind of neurosymbolic models for the variety of reasons that I sort of articulated. So that's challenge one. Challenge two is uh, the programs that we are designing, right? So now these neurosymbolic programs running on these tiny, tiny platforms, uh, unfortunately, uh, do require that we optimize the whole thing together for the target platform. So let's go back to the example I had, a, ne a neural object detector together with some trackers and stuff like that. Well, both of them have their parameters and it's the overall pipeline I'm trying to optimize. It's not just the neural pipeline. So that's point number one. We have to combine this assembly together with their own parameters. And the second thing is that these um, um, platforms are pretty complicated to deal with. So normal approach would be, can I create some sort of a proxy model for my hardware and then deal with things like, would it fit into this? Would, would it have the right latency and all? Turns out, yeah, if you are in the world of relatively resource rich, resource -rich <coughs> perhaps you can get away with it. Here, even one byte of excess in terms of memory means that your system is not gonna work. So we are un, un, under much tighter resource constraints. So that kind of leads to this issue that somehow when we are optimizing this neurosymbolic assembly uh, of a uh, program, it has to be done in a manner which is aware of the very tight constraints that exist on the platform. Otherwise you will not be able to deploy it. Um, yeah. Finally, uh, these models are, um, because we sort of, once you optimize them, to shrink them to the small size, they, 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 they enter their own fragility. So under parameterized models turn out to be more uh, susceptible to any sort of shifts which are happening. I've just shown an example from YOLO, uh, sorry, YOLO models. So they come in various sizes. Basically, when you go to the YOLO website, you can kind of download models with different parameters. They're all trying to show is that large models have better resilience to um, uh, sort of objects that they have not seen or objects which are kind of somehow weird in some manner. So that's something that we encounter again and again, that sort of uh, robustness to the whole shift. Robustness to slight variations in the tasks. That's another one where under parameterized models fail to work. <coughs> Uh, relative to larger models, if you're run, running, if you have access to sort of, let's say, tens or hundreds of megabytes. And then finally, uh, there are lots of other issues that are more about the system characteristics or the deployment environment. I uh, work a lot in M Health, every person is different, work a lot in buildings, buildings differ. Uh, there are timestamp accuracy issues because oftentimes you're collecting data from different places. So uh, when you're looking at fine grained events, kind of timestamp inaccuracy translates into uh, issues. And then also variations in platform latency. Uh, so if you have a reinforcement like system, which is closed loop, then again, uh, variations in these things end up affecting the overall application performance. So all of these sort of things somehow require that. Some some combination some combination of design time and runtime systems have to be uh, have to kick in. So let's uh, uh, so there are sort of three things that we have been exploring in recent times. One is uh, could we create an optimization framework where uh, this architecture such can handle both neural and symbolic, and part of it just requires moving away from uh, kind of just a making the whole process to be one which can which is differentiable as you could with neural network to one with where we can handle mixed parameters and all. Second one, uh, creating kind of the engineering pipeline, if you may, so that we can go to the whole workflow and create things which actually deploy. Um, and so we'll talk about that. And then finally, um, at least some set of techniques where we can take care of the fragility that the smaller, smaller models, models have. 
So, so what we did, this is, this is work which has involved work with ARM actually quite a bit. Uh, so one, one thing that we started out creating was um, a hardware and loop Bayesian neuro, neuro symbolic architecture circuit, a lot of buzzwords there. Uh, so Bayesian optimization is well known uh, process where kind of what you do is you sort of use some sort of a surrogate function to approximate your search space. And then you kind of, that guides your search. So you kind of look for candidate solutions, evaluate them, and then see where, where next do I go. Uh, the nice thing is that this kind of approach lets us, uh, is inherently gradient free. And so it can let us model uh, constraints which are hard to do in a differentiable manner. So in our case, it's things like latency, things like what's the SRAM size, uh, what's the memory size, these kind of things. So, uh, so we uh, use this framework now to be able to do it. One of the first things that we did, this, this was a collaboration with ARM, as I mentioned, where we created a um, sort of a, a nice parallel hyperparameter search for this. ARM uses it for the chip designs. We use it for uh, this kind of pipeline, something called Mango. You can download it from ARM's website, actually. Um, now, what we do out here is the, the other part, hardware, hardware in the loop or platform in the loop. So at every, uh, our optimizer runs on some machine, but we have access to a bank of the platforms that we have. So we, we actually evaluate the candidates on hardware, and then based on that feedback, look for the next thing. So this gives us a couple of advantages. One is get we guarantee that it would be deployable because if there is a, if we compile and it turns out that won't fit into the memory, we just reject that candidate. So unlike a proxy based solution where you can go down that path and then eventually end up with a solution which actually doesn't work and then sort of go back. So, so that's, that's one part. Second thing is this ability to find candidates won't work, which actually interestingly turns out to also speed up our search. So if you might say, oh, every time, every candidate we are compiling, downloading, evaluating, we actually come out ahead in terms of the actual uh, performance. So that's the first component of our system. We call it tiny MS. Um, so, um, uh, we have used it quite extensively. First, we obviously evaluated it in benchmarks. So in this world of tiny stuff, there is this benchmark called ML perf tiny inference benchmark. It has kind of a bunch of uh, things. I've picked three uh, uh, out here. One is uh, image recognition on cipher type images. Another one is anomaly detection in an unsupervised setting. And then keyword spotting in acoustic data stream. The precise details don't matter. Point is on each one of these, we show significant improvements. And basically what's happening is that uh, we have access to this tool, which is automating a lot of the search process, which basically competing solutions are kind of manually tweaked, uh, um, sort of human ingenuity at work. And uh, it's kind of the same thing where when in the early days of logic synthesis and high level synthesis and VLSI, pretty soon tools were creating solutions much better than human designers were just because of the iteration cycle being too large. Now, this is a benchmark. We were in this game because we were creating some of these systems. So there were two systems that we were actively working with. Uh, one is something called Tiny Odom. And this was actually driven by the international project I was engaged in where we were creating tags for uh, tracking health of sea animals. And the challenge out there is that these animals spend a lot of time underwater. So we don't have GPS uh, signal. So we have to rely quite a bit on inertial tracking. And then whenever they come to the surface, if uh, we immediately get to know that they are at Z equal to zero, the mean the vertical dimension. But if they spend sufficiently long time, then we get X, Y also, because then we have enough of a GPS signal to kind of localize. So essentially it's kind of a standard Kalman tracking problem, but uh, we have uh, a longer, sort of time spent under ocean. So we were creating these sort of super low power tags which <coughs> got attached to sort of whales uh, by our Australian collaborators. But the point, uh, point, the bigger point is that we had to optimize this pipeline. Okay. And same kind of thing, uh, we also actually ended up applying in a agricultural robot context. So, so a bun bunch of scenarios. Point I wanted to show is that prior to our work, there was stuff which has emerged, which has showed that Yes, neural networks can perform better, but these were mostly people who were picking ResNet and these kind of models from the world of standard machine learning, computer vision kind of things, and then just applying it out. 
So for us, it was a low hanging fruit because we could immediately sort of optimize. So significant gains in terms of shrinking these models while retaining performance or modest degradation of performance relative to much larger models which you couldn't, couldn't deploy. So that was one piece of work, tiny ODAP. Mm -hmm. Another one, Auritus, this is, uh, I'm sure many of you have AirPods or something similar. Um, yeah, so these things have tiny microcontrollers, but basically the way these systems currently work is they just stream the data to your phone and then anything interesting either happens in the port or uh, perhaps out of the cloud. Again, there's a world of people who have kind of uh, worked on these kind of models. What we again found was an orders of magnitude uh, shrinking in size and several percentage points improvements in the model accuracy also. Again, just because we had have our disposal kind of nice pipeline of data. Um, what Tiny NS lets us do is to really kind of traverse the architecture space. So what you see out here is that as we throw at it a bigger microcontroller, it kind of expands to fill it out uh, because kind of the goal, the way we had written the goal out here was that give us the best accuracy while fitting if you do it on the same processor, uh, then again, same thing. So in this case, you might imagine that I'm running in sort of a setting where there are multiple software modules and I'm budgeting the RAM among them. So what you again see is that as they allocate different amounts of SRAMs to it, uh, it uh, sort of scales the accuracy curve accordingly. So much like in the EDA world of chips where we could traverse this area performance curve, we kind of have that kind of an ability. Now, one thing to keep in mind is these are significantly compute intensive tasks. Okay, so we have, I mean, some of these results that I'm showing, these are uh, depending on the GPU we run, obviously. I mean, in some cases, I think, uh, we run for GPU hours to maybe a few GPU days. Okay, so, so it's not like of that button to get the result back, but still sufficiently good that uh, relative to the human effort that it might take. Okay, so. We have tiny NS, which gives us this uh, tool. Then, um, yeah, uh, and, and by the way, one thing to bear in mind is because um, of this gradient free nature, we can not simply work with the parameters <coughs> that the neural backbone has, but we can also work with the parameters that a symbolic program might have. We can think of the symbolic program as kind of some sort of a computational flow graph. Uh, which is parameterized and we can kind of work with that. So the basic framework is in place. So the next step was, can we now begin to create things which are more uh, complete neurosymbolic programs? So a few years ago, Henry Kotz, the well-known AI researcher in his um, keynote at AAAI had uh, sort of given this taxonomy of neurosymbolic programs, which kind of show a few different ways neural and symbolic entities interact with each other. So we kind of adopted that. And there are a few things that I think he missed out on, but that's kind of almost besides the point. So uh, case number one, symbolic, neurosymbolic. Okay, so what's going on out here? There's an initial symbolic layer followed by a neural layer. Uh, there are many use cases for this uh, situation. Firstly, oftentimes, we are not feeding raw <coughs> sensor data to the neural model. We are feeding some sort of a uh, human-derived feature space that 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 symbolic layer might, uh, might uh, uh, it could also be some sort of a sanity check or cleaning that we are doing on the sensory data. So that uh, this case number one, case number two is neuro symbol. So neural followed by symbolic. Uh, the complex event scenario that I described fits into this model. Uh, the neural layer is giving us instantaneous things that are happening and then uh, feeds into some sort of a finite state machine and kind of helps guide that. Another example is that if it's a deep model system, there's some action going out, I'm putting some sort of a shield on there. So that's the neuro symbol, uh, neuro, neural feeds into symbol, uh, symbolic part. Case number three, uh, which we encounter quite a bit is where uh, uh, kind of I'm borrowing Cox's uh, uh, name, neuro, together with compiled symbolic. And what this is referring to is at the time we are training the neural network, we have a symbolic constraint which is driving it. So for example, let's say I'm doing something about, I don't know, a neural network model which is learning how to 
control uh, the speed then steering wheel of a car and maybe it needs to be aware of like the speed constraints and stuff like that that would have to be so that's the, that could be the regularization constraint that feeds in over it uh, fourth one is the symbol, symbolic and neural stuff kind of sitting in parallel. And this comes in various forms. So sometimes it is uh, my outer <coughs> algorithm and a symbolic algorithm for classical physics, first principles type model. But then some parameters are actually coming from a neural network because the phys underlying physics is too hard. So maybe estimation of friction, viscosity, something like that feeding in. Or the other way around, um, uh, where uh, the neural part is getting some information with, from a physics channel of some form, some additional information coming in. And finally, kind of a more general picture where we can just really view these things as some sort of an arbitrary composition of neural and symbolic things kind of going, going through. So what we did, do is we, for each one of these cases, we have kind of devised, uh, I mean, they're just scripts or uh, sort of designed flow pipelines uh, which which had, uh, which kind of take care of these particular cases. Uh, honest, I mean, at some level, more common for us are really the first three or four, first four cases, uh, not not the general picture. Uh, but what it gives us uh, to the users is kind of a complete pipeline. That's, I mean, they basically need to think of in terms of which one of these uh, situations their particular application falls under, and then we kind of produce runnable code. We have to produce runnable code because our optimization is harder than the loop. So at every step, we create code, uh, compile it, run it, or if it fails to run, kind of discard that candidate and kind of go back. So that's um, uh, that's that's what we do. So uh, some uh, some examples of what it lets us do. So for example, this is an application where we are working with uh, kind of uh, gesture recognition. Uh, using IMU data, so something like your wristwatch or something, and kind of looking at hand gestures and all. So, uh, so we're working um, uh, this is sort of some work with uh, ST Microelectronics, which is a company which makes a lot of these chips and all that we uh, work with. So, uh, one of the things that their chips have the capability of in some cases is that uh, they have special hardware for certain kind of uh, features. Those hardware resources are limited, so we kind of have to figure out um, what are the candidate models. So this is kind of similar to when you're designing a machine learning algorithm, you have to kind of figure out the feature space and obviously well-known methods, except that they are totally hardware unaware. What we are able to do it is that given your hardware platform, what's the combination uh, there? So this is a case of symbolic followed by neural uh, that uh, we are able to do. What you see out here is as we go down, the more resource <coughs> platforms and it finds kind of combinations of features with increasingly are kind of increasing in size or are costly as a computation and therefore um, yeah, and end up resulting in better performance. Um, another one, yeah, yeah, so yeah, um, yeah, uh, the improvement that uh, gets. Uh, another thing uh, that we can do is we can optimize over multiple backbones. Okay, so we, uh, again, since we were aiming for something which is kind of not simply prove the point, but this is a tool suite that we like to use and all. So we have kind of uh, the utility of tools like these in part depends upon the libraries and uh, the workflow scripts. <laughs> and like, yeah, so we've been kind of developing them over time. So. This is an example where activity detection and fault detection. So uh, going back to the previous slide, if you stick with a single backbone model, TCN stands for uh, uh, temporal uh, convolution networks. Um, uh, so we get 2 percentage point improvement. But if you give us the flexibility of multiple backbones, <laughs> uh, huge improvement while kind of working with really, really small memory. Uh, final example, this is an object tracker. Uh, so <clears throat> video, uh, sort of the neural network is doing uh, object tracking and then uh, sort of a symbolic tracker is really working across time out here. So our uh, baseline out here was uh, sort of uh, uh, reported result, which was carefully manually tuned. Uh, Networked on uh, same memory limit, which is a 250 megabyte three uh, uh, GPU days. So essentially, we are elim eliminating the drudgery. And if you give us more memory, we come up with a better solution. So again, it lets us 
create this uh, lets you adapt uh, yeah, ad adapt to the resources. The other thing I would like to point out is that we are insanely parallelizable in the sense that uh, you can have multiple platforms search in parallel uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so we are actually currently in the process of just building a setup where a more powerful server with a bank of IoT platforms and then really making that as a resource that we can work on. Um, final one, so this again relates to the tiny odom uh, type setting. So working with one of my mechanical engineering colleagues, so we've been working on this little agricultural robot and deployed in Ventura County in uh, some strawberry farm. Uh, and we need to localize this thing. So this is inertial with uh, some GPS access. The reason here is purely GPS guided to issues. GPS is noisier. Uh, uh, and the other part is just power hungry. So we, again, sort of uh, in a microcontroller class device on that tiny little robot that you get developed, um, our approach, which is going to be last one, kind of for me, significant improvement while fitting into the platform. So say we're coming at uh, uh, ICRA, just end of this month. So, so this tool already has turned out to be of sort of good good value for value to us uh, in a uh, in a uh, in, in, in in settings that we kind of care about. Final point I want to make is that yes, we can optimize these things and all, but it does come at a cost, namely the, these models are fragile. Uh, they are less robust across domains. So like, for example, um, our 3D sort of inertial uh, 3D trajectory model, um, when we apply it, let's say we train it on a drone and apply it to a person, doesn't, doesn't perform as well, whereas bigger models does do that sort of translate that better activity recognition, same thing. So the tinier models are more fragile. The other issue, what we learned is they're also fragile in a different way. They are less backward compatible. So <coughs> oftentimes in this world, what uh, uh, people kind of report, oh, we shrank and the model is as good. But the thing is we're focusing on uh, uh, sort of average case performance. One of the things in these systems is as we play around with the model, particularly a deployed model, and if we are updating it, it's important that you maintain backward compatibility. And by that, I mean a situation under which the system was working previously should continue to work. That would be the mental model that a user would have. It should not degrade where it previously worked well. Uh, so improvement should be strictly monotonic. So, so, so those are issues. Um, so how can we do it? There are sort of uh, three things that we generally sort of work with. One is, given that we have this symbolic, neurosymbolic NAS framework, then robustness just becomes another symbolic constraint for us. So for certain kind of things, we are just able to do that. So for example, adversarial robustness, um, uh, we kind of just make it as a requirement at the network architecture search space, and that sort of helps us uh, significantly. So that's approach number one. Approach number two that works is uh, making context a metadata channel. And what I'm referring to out here is that the inference that I seek to make perhaps depends upon some sensors, but oftentimes also feeding into the model additional information about the deployment context which may either be coming from some sort of a manual knowledge base or maybe coming from some other sensors, turns out to be quite useful. So I have a couple of examples out here. Uh, one is uh, where in things, situations like where sensors are deployed in buildings and all, we kind of feed some information about the floor plan or uh, how the sensors are located in the space, those kind of information. Another example, which is shown figure out here is, so this is a deep reinforcement learning type setting where the platform latency is varying. And uh, if that is not known to the model, then the performance sort of uh, often, often, often degrades, uh, particularly if the latency goes up because of background workload or things like that. Uh, or if you're working across a network, then increased network latency. So kind of the idea out here is that in many settings, we are able to provide additional uh, system state like counters from a processor, for example, which then lets the system learn what 
current workload is and the current uh, latency would be. And what you see in these videos which are playing, the top one is the standard domain randomization. Uh, where at training time, we kind of expose it to different uh, latencies, but the model otherwise is unaware. So when the latency changes, it has no way of knowing what action to do. At the bottom one is what we call as time and state, but basically it's referring to that we give this additional context information as part of an enhanced state, and then sort of work with it. Uh, so leads to more sort of uh, more robustness, less fragility. And finally, I kind of alluded to that how uh, yeah, a challenge with sensor data is that uh, uh, it's very hard to label on the fly. It's very uh, <coughs> destructive for the user to label on the fly. But at the same time, we do have tremendous unlabeled data which is coming in. So in some applications, like this application we have, this is going for with Jack's um, uh, group at uh, Virginia. Uh, so this is using these vibration sensors and all, but on a wrist to kind of as a user interface device. And there is considerable human to human variation, uh, but the task has constraints because we essentially what we do is we give the user as like a virtual keyboard, which they can tap on the back of their hand and then uh, use it to provide input to the, uh, to the system to the variable. Uh, so in this particular case, what happens is we Train a, uh, train a model which has some assumption about what the population of the user is doing. And then this particular user, uh, when it is typing, we begin to see these clusters form, which are kind of near, but not quite. So the performance is degrading. So then we kind of uh, <coughs> continually learn a transform and kind of shift uh, shift those clusters. Cluster so the way the system ends up doing it, it starts out with somewhat inferior um, accuracy, 90% or so, but then after a few days of deployment, it kind of, uh, and adaptation in this manner, it converges. Uh, this adaptation is happening where? On the watch so itself? This adaptation is happening on the back end. Okay, so this, this uh, yes, it happens on a nightly basis. It's not happening on the watch. It's, um, <coughs> I think, uh, learning on the tinier platforms is a great problem and uh, we, we are not there. Is not happening. Okay, so uh, and coming close to the end. So uh, putting it all together, uh, really kind of, um, I, I think the case I would like to submit is that firstly, this world of sensors meet machine learning type pipelines is pretty interesting. It's letting us do things which sensors of the old, I mean, uh, were just too boring, relatively speaking, uh, but they do present this engineering challenge. Uh, we are, uh, I, think, I think part of it is an education problem in the sense, like right in the department out here, there's a computing division and there is a systems division. The two sides are different because uh, and I think and we are not unique in that regard. I think every place is like that, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, so we, uh, so one, uh, yeah, somehow we create these tall, fat engineers who know everything that's unlikely. I think the answer is much like which happened in tools and all to, uh, in, in chips, all, it's to create the right type of tools. And I think, I think that's, that's what I'm trying to sort of emphasize uh, that hopefully we begin to see EDA for this kind of learning enabled IoT systems. That's, that's, that's what sort of I'm hoping to pull off. Okay. Uh, some other uh, things which have sort of come up in discussions with sort of friends and collaborators and all. Uh, so one is uh, the focus thus far still is on processors. So what the work that we have done uh, still has been MCU focused, although we have enriched the type of things we are doing. There's also this world of neural accelerators and the features that exist on these platforms. Um, at least certain kind of stuff can be accelerated. So that going up to that. Uh, as part of bigger systems, this is again, sort of if you go back to when you early days of like chip synthesis and all same story that to get the correct picture of what is going on, you have to do all of these things in context of the environment you are going to deploy in. Okay, or if you're deploying the hardware, then what will the upper layers of the software do? It's the same story out here. Uh, if you look at some of the models that currently exist, right? I mean, an autonomous driving stack, just a perception stack probably has 20, 30 different neural models. So these are complicated things. Somehow sort of this world of multiple interacting models and all, we don't have that. Uh, third thing, which is right now the mindset still is, we are kind of 
training and everything from scratch. And much like we are seeing in uh, other parts where a few foundational models uh, for vision or language are doing wonders, uh, perhaps uh, one of the things in the CPS IoT space is to have a library, solid library of these foundation models, which are multimodal, uh, where we aggregate data from the whole bunch of things which are out there. I mean, uh, there are probably a few hundred IMU data sets with some different assumptions. Um, of uh, various kind of multimodal things emerging, perhaps as a community effort kind of creating uh, this model, which we can then rely on kind of the equivalent of the BERTs and uh, uh, GPT. Uh, I think another interesting space, which uh, personally I've been trying to play with and figure things out. So while we normally think of LLMs uh, purely in terms of like as a generative thing, but one of the things they generate is code. And there's some pretty interesting work which I've begun to see now is where uh, they're generating code which is interacting with sensors and actuators as tools. So what I mean by that is that we offer them a palette of little programs and APIs and whatnot. And the role that these large language models are doing is that given some, let's say a high level description of a complex event of interest, it's then synthesizing a program which calls the right sensor and the right tools to then answer that complex event. And uh, I think, I think uh, so I, uh, and imagine a smart home type setting, imagine a robotic setting, I think some interesting potential sort of things. So that's all I have to say. Uh, to summarize, I think there's this interesting space where uh, this intersection of <coughs> stuff happening at the device, okay, so where even our smartphone is like a server. Um, um, uh, uh, the world here is not just of a single neural model, but really these more complicated systems, and that's what we got to engineer. And then finally, kind of just making them robust. I know there's some pretty interesting work, I mean, uh, again, Yasser, but he's doing some pretty cool work on verifying provably some of these properties. That's kind of a design time view, but you can also imagine a runtime perspective around it. Uh, so there's some pretty interesting possibilities out there. Uh, so here are all my collaborators, some students, some senior researchers, and an awesome set of funding agencies which have been which have given money to me to chase these things. So thanks to all of them. So. With that, I'm going to stop and take on any questions. All right, time for questions. Eddie, go ahead. Um, very interesting talk. I think your last slide on future work answered some of my questions, which was regarding FPGA based versus processors, which I think opens up new directions. And also, maybe partly one of other items also may answer is. Um, so this is on the individual device, but um, as you I think said, most of these IoT and CPS work in a very collaborative, so we have a lot of cooperative devices and applications are sometimes decentralized. Um, so not necessarily the whole ML is embedded in one, one place. device, and I've seen how it does work for that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, things collaborating at the edge is another. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think I think um, yeah, we're doing some stuff towards it, but I don't have an idea on how to integrate it into. The <laughs> it also can be applied also at the edge between the device too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's a, just a constraints are more sure. a little bit more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Another thing is also um, regarding very low, ultra low power devices that say the intermittently powered like solar. Intermittently powered, right? And yeah. then your power can is very that it has a variations and then you have a hardware in loop do you have power in loop or we don't currently but that would be uh, that 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 would certainly well, that's be more of the online learning part or you think you can also I, I think it uh, so so in some senses there you have an implied control loop in terms of um, uh, duty setting control if you may right I mean so maybe that's that could be jointly learned somehow for the particular I haven't thought about it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, with my colleague Puneet and Yasser is engaged, we are kind of chasing a proposal where we are kind of dabbling in this idea that platform gives us some knobs and could we decide some control over them as part of it. Yeah, I know, it's interesting. Other questions? 
I have a question, I guess, for you, Kai. Okay? So, uh, interesting talk. Very, very nice work. My first question is, uh, have you considered in the context of your, let's say, set up for guys for any other, uh, basically models where you're fragmenting the models into parts and running partly on the, is that in the design space for consideration? The current tool, current tool doesn't, but I guess much like what Eli was ask, uh, 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 asking, it, it should be. I mean, in the sense that okay. real world things are split across things and even simple stuff like uh, uh, have multiple edge uh, devices and I'm splitting them or between the device and the thing. So we, uh, I mean, we currently don't optimize for those settings, but certainly one has to, uh, and so these are all parts. So, yeah. Uh, and including the one thing serving as a filter to another thing, they have more expensive yeah. models so, somewhere else. So in, models. In, in, in some senses, I mean, harks back to when we were mapping algorithms to chips, we always faced this problem. If I can't fit, fit everything into chips, if it's scattered over multiple chips, then again, how that partitioning is done. But more importantly, it's not simply necessarily partitioning as is, but perhaps we have uh, some sort of a outgoing transformer and an incoming transformer, which let's, or replication of computation and all sort of transformations that you can do at that level, we, uh, we, we haven't even sort of. I have one more thing, and unless, I have more questions, but one more naive question to ask you. So imagine that we don't do what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And let's stick to the old world that we were in because we are comfortable with this world, right? The difference mm -hmm. is that we are sort of going to take all the information of, we can say visual data that's a little bit complicated or whatever, but at least for IMUs and other inertial sensor devices and for lots of different devices, right? Just get the sensor reading into the centralized edge device, whatever it is, and do your entire processing there. Mm -hmm. Instead of sort of pushing this learning on the, the, yeah. the so what's wrong with that? How, how, so what will not work? So firstly, in many cases, I don't have the network. And yet I have to make the decisions on the fly. My real example being one, I mean, we just can't, okay? Uh, so, so, so often, or people satellites, that's another domain that, um, uh, so there are settings where uh, you don't have the luxury. There's a second, uh, okay. Forget that, the Se second, networks are available. Uh, if networks are available, and in many cases, the data are too high rate. Uh, so energy becomes an issue. Um, yeah, but if even that is not an issue, right? I mean, then of course, by all means, mm -hmm. go, go to go to on-prem. Uh, so that, recall I had that slide, right? I mean, three things. I have a, uh, I can offload. I have a resource-rich edge device or, okay, I mean, if you can be in the first territory, that's the most comfortable place to no, be. I guess the, the question's deeper question is, if I draw, let's say, X axis these technologies and Y axis the revenue that one can expect from whatever it is, right? So if I go from one technology to the next step, is there a quantum jump in capabilities and applications and things become it, possible? It comes are, possible it comes a significant trade off, right? I mean, so yes, uh, my capability of my model goes up if I'm able to run it okay, but then the amount of data I can feed to it goes up. So, so that trade-off is very application dependent. There is also the economics of it, right? It's easier to monetize the model of offloading, harder to monetize. And this is where different companies are gonna have a different perspective, right? I mean, and I guess you could argue that some of the debate we see playing out between whatever Apple's view things should be on device, Google's view things should be in the cloud is really a manifestation of that thinking. And yeah, so yeah, this is not just a world of technology, I mean, there are economics. somebody has a question. I want to bring you to the question of bias that happens when you have any kind of ML model, big or small, by pushing stuff into this tiny ML model running on this tiny device. Um, what does it do to the bias that you have? So, with sure, great question. So firstly, I mean, evidence seems to indicate it would probably worsen. I mean, we didn't explicitly explore bias, but I mean, other measures of fragility. Um, one of the model actually is in case of the handheld type situation, what's happening is, so the back end also has one other advantage. It has a population that is low, not just your personal, right? So quite likely the model would be that once you are in a resource energy rich setting, like charging and all, then you upload some information, a new model gets trained and it gets pushed down. So in some settings, we are doing that, not in this work that I described, but uh, in, in the kind of settings where um, there's a local reinforcement learning loop, and 
uh, egg divide, but then some information is sent out, a new model is trained on order of hours and days basis, and then it's pushed out. So that's, that's the next thing. And it's probably going to be part of the mix. I, I, think, I think my example of ocean animals is ridiculously extreme. I mean, of course, most examples are probably. Uh, that probably depends also on the ER time, right? Your you, performance yeah, um, so yeah, you can't do those changes real time on the in the model I described, but I've seen some work where uh, they are doing just like this tiny ML, there's an offshoot within that called tiny learning or something like that, where they're attempting to do some fine tuning of kind of the final layer. One of the challenges is reliably detecting when you actually are facing a shift. Uh, so it's a tricky problem, but I have seen in context of I do some work. Okay, unless there is any burning question, let's thank our speaker and